Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I hope you had a very good trip to FESPA. And uh, I have the honor to start uh, the first uh, signage hub session for today. My presentation is a tutorial. And uh, the, the aim of the tutorial is to present uh, the Beglit applications and how you will handle uh, color management workflow and uh, specific substrate behavior in order to measure as you see and also print as expected. So the concept I'm going to present is called printing the expected. It's something that uh, Fogra launched several years ago and this expanded into digital printing to allow basically uh, common appearance or production using different printing technology, different substrates, uh, different locations, different processing workflows, also different viewing environments. So the challenge is not to print just color or colorful, but to have a meaningful reproduction that will fulfill the expectation criteria of the content creator. When we look at uh, substrates used in uh, uh, for Beglit applications, we can, we can classify them depending on the application we are going to use them. So we are having outdoor application or indoor application. This correlates very nicely with the viewing distance from close range viewing distance to wide range viewing distance. But also specific to the substrate itself, it's the thickness of the substrates that is very important because it will relate from the color management point of view to the way we are going to measure those substrates and also to its appearance. If it's a clear uh, substrate, like a glass, or a translucent material, like a backlit film. A typical backlit printing combination that basically include a printing system, which is, well, most of the printing, digital printing technologies we are having available now, starting from water-based, uh, all the way to uh, UV curable or dye sublimation. Also the substrates, well, most of the substrates are either transparent, like clear, or translucent. And uh, uh, one of the most important properties is for translucent substrates is their ability to scatter light in order to uh, create the backlit uh, uh, perception uh, from the viewer when the uh, substrate is illuminated from the back. And also we have, again, thick and thin substrates. We also need, in this combination, of course, the ink. And the ink needs to be a very strong chromatic ink. Uh, from the point of view of the printing system, we have specific print modes that will allow, either through high resolution or through high ink amount, to create this uh, color vividness that uh, is needed for the Begley production. And we are still having special behavior inks like white inks that it's used for a specific application uh, in uh, 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 this category of Beglit. Also, we are having workflow, which basically it's given us the settings, the, dr the driver of the printer, we're giving the resolution, the printing mode, the speed, and all the other uh, characteristics that are relevant to set up the whole media set. And some of these Beglit applications also require a lamination that uh, in one way or the other will influence the final uh, perception of the reproduction. One of the key aspects of printing the expected concept is the fact that it's completely based on the measure as we see. So the whole metrological process is the based on how the viewer actually perceives the reproduction. And for that, we need to establish a metrological protocol. And we need the tools like measuring devices, like chart, like profiling application, like validation application. So all the necessary tools that we are going to use in order to control our printing combination made of the printing system, of the ink, of the substrate, and the printing mode. And of course, because we said measure as we see, that means that the viewer is also involved in this uh, assessment of the final product and we need a compliant a 3664 compliant illuminaire 
either a viewing booth for reflective and uh, transparency viewer for backlit product. And of course, we can actually use even the actual uh, light box because this is one of the few cases in uh, uh, signage applications where actually most of the time we will know what will be the actual viewing environment from the point of view of the light. This is a pyramid that was developed by the uh, process standard digital concept in order to show how we can control your whole process from the definition of the print combination all the way to the reproduction itself in order to have a meaningful control of the printing parameters, of the color management settings, and the way you are printing in order to obtain printing we expected. So we are going to take this procedure and going step by step from the bottom of the pyramid all the way to the top in order to explain what we need to do to obtain this concept. So, simplified, we have three stages. We have the evaluation stage, we have the control stage, and we have the verification stage. Well, any metrological protocol start with choosing the right measuring devices, and when we look at the characteristics that in general are required by a measuring protocol and the measuring device, we can very easily identify from each characteristic exactly what we need. So we need the D0 geometry, because this is the geometry that is used for transmission measurement. We need larger, medium to larger apertures, so smaller apertures are not sufficient for backlit applications. Of course, we need a spectrophotometer. And usually, the current D0 spectrophotometers are equivalent of the M0, and I will explain a little bit later what does that means. And because we are measuring a lot, and uh, measurement in transmissive mode are usually slow, we need an automated device. And we have also transmission sample, but we have also thick and thin samples. So we would rather prefer to have an automated me measurement process in order to you know, give us time to do something else when, until the measurement is done. So this is how a D0 transmission geometry looks like. So basically we have a, a lamp, and in top of the lamp there is a diffuser that will scatter the light, and between the, this diffuser and the measurement head is the sample we are going to measure. The rest is identical with any 45-0 geometry optical instrument. Getting back to our measurement protocol, this is based on uh, the ISO 13655 from the 2009, which basically specify how this D0 transmission measurement should take place. There is no M condition, as I stated, uh, in the previous slide for the uh, D0 measurement, that's because there is no specification in the standard, but usually this type of spectrophotometer are using the same type A illuminant as any M0 device uh, would do. There is a current revision of this standard and most likely there will be some modification in the way the D0 geometry it will be defined. Well, from the point of view of backing, we have either no backing, of course, since we are measuring tr transmissive, but we will see that there are some substrate that require a transparent backing in order to allow uh, us to measure them. And there is one specific consideration we have to take into account. Well, in transmission mode, all the measurements are done relative to the substrate. So that means the, the spectrophotometer is zeroed on the substrate itself. From the point of view of appraisal or comparison between the reflective and uh, transmission reproduction, for example, like having a, a contract proof and your backlit uh, reproduction, we also may have some problems when we put side by side a reflective proof with the transmission application. So this need to be evaluated and there are some restrictions that apply to this kind of comparison. And of course, our protocol needs to include some averaging as moon as of the data in order to you know, 
compensate for uh, different variation of the measurement protocol of uh, or of the uniformity of the uh, area we are measuring. So, chromatic adaptation. For the bell application, this is very important because this is the reason why we are measuring in so-called relative mode. As you can see, you know, when you look at the viewing, the backlit uh, illuminar, we can see the, the lamps. But as soon as we put uh, unprinted substrate on top of it, this acts like a, a scattering surface. And this is how, you know, your eye will adapt to the viewing condition. So we are perceiving both light and the substrate as the white point of the viewing environment. That's why we are going to measure in relative mode. My choice for measurement in uh, uh, transmissive mode, it's a uh, Barbieri Spectro LFP. This is a very versatile device that allows to both measurement of thick and thin substrates, also in reflective and transmissive mode. I'm going to use the bigger apertures of Spectro LFP, so six or eight millimeters, usually six, eight depends. For example, when you're measuring a texture substrate like a baglet PVC, or a Begley textile, that you know the texture need a, a wider range for a wider area for averaging, and that's recommended to use the eight millimeter aperture. <coughs> Barbieri has a special holder for measurement uh, transparent substrates. Unfortunately, due to the nature of the measurement, this holder that get very easily scratched and these scratches will influence the quality of the measurement. So usually what I recommend is actually to cut and just to keep the right side, sorry, the left side of the holder and to attach with a scotch or a self-adhesive tape uh, the sample you are going to measure. Also, instead of the fast mode measurement, I use the up and down measurement again to avoid, you know, scratching, for example, backlit film or a transparent foil may get easily scratched by the measurement head if it's move in intimate contact uh, between the, uh, the head and the uh, measured area. Another consideration is uh, the way you uh, register, so to speak, the measurement area. This can be done in automatic mode, but this also implies that the measurement head will move again across the surface of the sample. And in order to avoid, again, the scratches, this is much easier done in manual mode. So you just select the corners of the uh, area you're going to measure manually. And because we want high quality measurement, we are going to use the so-called high accuracy, which means that the measurement head will calibrate every second row. Measuring thin substrates. Usually, this category implies the thickness of the substrate going up to 500 microns. And these are the most common ones, like uh, baglit film, baglit PVC, textiles, uh, city lights. One minor issue that may uh, come up here is the electrostatic charging of the sample, because uh, the way the sample is moved by the spectral LFP across the uh, um, table of the device, this may charge the sample, and it will get stuck on the uh, device table instead of moving. So this normally can be easily done if you have a static discharger connected to your uh, measuring device. We also have some stiff substrates, no major issues here. The only interesting thing is how you're going to measure a self-adhesive substrate that you're going to use for baglit applications. Because these type of substrates are basically have a liner. And as soon as you take off the liner, your substrate will adhere to anything. So for this kind of measurement, it's recommended to use a very thin transparent foil. And this is the transparent backing that I was referring to in the previous slide. This will allow basically to transfer the self-adhesive substrate from the liner to the transparent foil and allow us meaningful measurement of the printed sample. Well, there is one more category, you know, very flexible substrates. These have somewhat unpredictable behavior, so they can move, you know, very nicely, but they can also run into 
problems. So this is the only situation that you have to go and use the Barbieri transparent holder. Measuring thick substrates. Well, in this category, most of the substrates are over one, one millimeter in thickness. And here we have everything. We have basically acrylic, plexiglass, glass, any type of substrate that it's either transparent, like clear, or translucent, translu like opaque or semi-opaque. And these substrates are usually very difficult to measure because the more the thickness is, the more light from the lamp of the measuring device will scatter inside the substrate and very few information will actually end up in the measuring head. So what we are going to do about this kind of substrate? How we are going to actually measure them meaningfully? Of course, you know, some sort of substrates from this category, they have also very, you know, smaller thickness. So like one millimeter. So if you usually work on a five millimeter substrate, but you have also the option to, 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 to get a one millimeter version of that, use that for measurement, even if you print on the five millimeter one. But sometimes this is not available. You don't have a choice. Simply the substrate you are printing on, it's only in the thickness like five to seven millimeter. So what you are going to do about it, how you are going to measure it. Well, the reality of these substrates is that most of them will be printing using UV curable technology. And in this printing environment in particular, most of the ink will be cured directly on top of the substrate. And since we are aiming actually to measure in relative mode, which means the substrate will be excluded, we can use a surrogate substrate. You remember the hot foil, the transparent foil I was using previously to uh, transfer from a, a self-adhesive liner, well, we can use it again to capture the characteristic of our printing combination when we are going to print on glass or on acrylic or on plexiglass, we can use a surrogate substrate. So that depends on your printing system, what is the minimum thickness, you know, the thicker it, thinner it is, the better it is. So usually I'm always using between 100 and 160 microns, this is my ideal range of uh, printing and measuring this surrogate substrate. Other useful information. Well, understand the limitation of your printing combination because, you know, there are some general rules, but each of your printing combination and subsequently each of the substrates may put you in front of different decision. So as long as you find the right way to measure it so you get a meaningful readings that will correlate nicely with what you see, then basically you capture the right characteristic of your substrate. Also, any substrate should be measured in the way it's exposed. So the illuminating side should be also of the, of the substrate should be also the illuminate side of the measuring device. And the viewing side should be also the measurement side of the measuring device. If you're going to use, for example, a new V curable, usually the ink is matte, you print it on glass on one side, so the reproduction is matte, but you, if you turn the glass in the mirror, you, the ink matte is no longer. You are only working with a gl glossy substrate. So for this kind of situation, you have to do two combinations if you are going to print in both ways, so normal and mirror. Another consideration is the measuring time, which can be quite long. For example, the city light, the paper, it's quite opaque. I mean, the translucency level, it's, it's, it's very high. So that means that the measurement proto process will take a lot. So plan it carefully because if you get errors or you have to read down the measurement, you will lose valuable time. Going back to our process under digital pyramid, we are going to take each of the eight steps and see what we need to do. Well, first is the device itself. The most important thing here, because the backlit applications are usually very sensitive of, of their production, is to have the print heads align because the misalignment will lead to either a very grainy reproduction, it's, it's the height, 
for example, on a, on a flatbed, that it's not the optimum distance between the printing heads and the substrate, it will create a grainier production. Or if it's there are misalignment between them, that will create a registration problem. So the color planes won't be aligned. Also, missing nozzle can be a problem. Again, you will see every particular defect that your printing process will have, especially if we are talking about close range wing application. For high range wing application, it's not such a big issue if you have one missing nozzle, which will lead to one missing line. But if it's a close range wing application, th that will be very visible, and the quality of the image of the reproduction will suffer because of that. Identifying our printing combination. Of course, we have different printing technology, different substrates. Well, one of the challenges is that not all the substrates are working for every printing technology. So you may have different printing technology in your, in your printing house, and each one of them will require, let's say, a different substrate for the same type of application. So you may have a backlit film for UV, a backlit film for latex, and a backlit film for uh, solvent. So each one of them will need to take into account both aspects, that's printability, so you are able actually to print on that substrate, and runability, how the substrate will behave during the production. Usually, you have on any digital printing system, inkjet system, you have a range of printing modes that will vary from speed to quality. Usually, this printing mode that relates to the backlit printing are the one that are usually slow and involve you know putting a high amount of ink so in relation to this aspect you have to choose wisely what you want you know in terms of quality and speed and find the proper balance between them for specific printing system like solvent or latex the temperature are very important so during the printing process during the curing process this temperature will make the difference between a, a print that will lead to a correct ink substrate relation or a bad substrate ink relation. And that will create problems if you are going to laminate, for example, an over inking product or a not already dried product, that will create a big problem later in the, in the finishing area. Printing mode. So usually this type of printing application requires printing mode that will put a high amount of ink. This is done either by a high resolution printing mode or a resolution that was designed specifically for uh, backlit application printing. You can find this mode usually very easily to be identified in any printing system. So, for example, on uh, latex, they are called so called high density or 250 print modes. Uh, for uh, solvent, you will find high resolution printing modes with uh, usually one or two times the printing layer. And for UV curable, you will find a variety of names like uh, uh, double strike or double density or even called backlit mode. Going back to the stage three of our PSD pyramids, choosing the reference. So most of the print service provider are using, uh, you know, characterization set like FOGRA39 and equivalent uh, profile ICC coated V2 as a common nominator for all the uh, uh, print, the color management uh, settings in their production workflow. So this is an example of how these settings will look in, in Caldera. Typically, the same settings you can apply in Onyx or in uh, EF5, FireXF or in GMG software, they are working more or less in a similar way. You just need to write you know, the right settings in the right place. And one important thing is the simulation profile, because this is acting like a common denominator for all your input spaces. You, you can print RGB content, you can print CMYK content. We have, may have different input uh, source profiles, but if you're going to use this, you know, simulation profile, that will ensure that your reproduction on different printing combination, on different substrates, will have a common nominator, which actually will lead to a common appearance of the uh, reproductions. While we are using perceptual, remember I said that our measurement will be done in relative mode. That means that our substrate, our white point, is LAB 100. 
So we are going actually to use Perceptual, but our data are already relative calorimetric. So using Perceptual, we only ensure that we are scaling up our reproduction to the full extent of the output color gamut. This is why we are using Perceptual for this particular application. But the transformation from input to simulation profile are done relative colorimetric, for example, with black band compensation if it's possible. But from simulation profile to the output, we are going in perceptual mode. Keep in mind our data is still relative colorimetric. When we look at the color gamut of a typical uh, printing combination for the, bag for the baglet, we can see that the color gamut is quite huge. If we compare even in relative mode with ISO-coated V2, for example, we can see that the difference is quite high, and this is why we are using Perceptual, because this will ensure that our simulation profile, in our case ISO-coated V2, will scale up to the entire output color gamut, still maintaining the common appearance reproduction ideal. So, Analyzing our printing combination, we are basically set up, we choose the printing technology, we choose the substrate, now we are going to start you know, working on the media set, how we are going to create it. This type of application requires a wide color gamut, that's clear. We need a very high dynamic range, we, we need very chromatic colors, so it's really very important that we put the right amount of ink that will lead to these desires. But we also think that we need a print stability, because you have to do production, so you have to print maybe roll to roll, like several rolls, one after the other, and the relation between the ink and substrate needs to be properly, so the ink needs to be dried, and uh, shouldn't be any problem, you know, with the uh, uh, transfer of the ink uh, when the substrate is rolled on the roll. Another consideration here is the fact that Using this amount of ink for the ballet application, there is an economical aspect. The more ink you are going to use, the more expensive will be your printed product. So there are certain economical factors you need to take into account when you create this media set. So not too much ink, but enough ink to obtain a good output reproduction. So Getting back to our printing system, we need to understand how it works. First of all, it's obvious that the lightings, for example, are sharing the same channel with the darking. So these are only counting towards giving us more details in printing. They are not counting to the overall size of the gamut. We may have additional ink like orange and green or red, green and blue. There are specific printing systems that are using additional inks to extend the color gamut of the output. But we may also have special inks like white that we can use in a flatbed to obtain specific effect. And there are quite a nice range of application where we are going to use white. Keep in mind that also wider gamut is giving us a better gamut for reproduction of spot colors. Getting to our adjustment calibration, this is the first step where we are going to set up our ink limits, both per channel, also the transition between light and dark inks. The procedure itself it can be done in different ways that's workflow dependent. Some, some workflows allow you to set up the ink limit and then doing the linearization. Some workflows, it's a combination process, so you are doing both at the same time. So you're setting up the ink limit and you do this called linearization. Though the actual meaning of the word linearization may differ from the resulting calibration. And of course, we are having a total ink limit. It's basically there is no ink at all above this limit. As I said, the RIP will give us the tools to work in this department, but the concept is more or less similar regardless of what workflow are you using. So preparing a chart. Usually I prefer a 5% uh, ink limit chart, so this should give us enough information uh, that we can read. You have to be also uh, uh, paying attention to the overinking because this will be very visible. So, for example, if you are having too much ink uh, and this is discrete, I mean, it's not obvious. Uh, if it's obvious, you will have like coalescence and bleeding effects. But if it's not obvious, look for a dark ink frame around your patch. This will be a very good indication that you are having an overinking. 
So many, many printing technology will, when you look, you know, not that attend to it, you, you'll see a very uniform patch, but if you look, paying attention, you will see that there is a dark framework, frame around the patch, and this is an indication that you are having an over-inking situation. Practical tips here, so try to average several measurements. If sometimes one measurement is not enough, maybe you have a defective, uh, you know, uh, printed chart, or maybe, you know, you didn't align the measurement device properly. So just to make sure, do a couple of more measurements, average all the data, that will smooth them up and give you a better, uh, you know, material to work with. Well, we say in digital we don't use too much density because all our control and color management is based on colorimetry, but still, you know, density, either that it's an isostatus density or a spectral density have its usage. Because density in general is a very good indicator of how the ink film thickness is behaving in relation with the substrate. So we can see from the <coughs> from the measurement if this relation is good or not. Because if you are having, you know, at high ink intake variation, like density going up and down, that's a good indication that you reach the saturation in terms of how much ink that substrate can hold. And one of the way I'm preferring to evaluate my, my uh, uh, ink limits per channel, it's actually to look of relevance, axis of relevance for each of the colors. For example, cyan, it's a blue color, so I'm looking on the B-axis. Yellow, of course, it's a yellow color, so again I'm looking on the B-axis. Magenta, it's a red color, I'm looking on an A-axis. And black, well, for the black I'm only interested in how low is the L star value. When we are determining, basically, our M value for each of these color channels, you know, our printing combination becomes a printing condition because now we are setting some references that we can later use, for example, for the relinearization process. So when we are, you know, one year later or several months later when we change the print heads or we are just trying to compensate for our printer drifting, we can use this for recalibrate the whole media set. Ink limit per channel. So what we are doing here, we are basically trading, you know, ink amount for delta E's. So the question is very simple. Our best aim is to use the least amount of ink and to get, you know, the optimum amount of color out of our ink. The question for you is, how much ink do you want to trade for just one delta E? Well, take into account the relinearization process, also take into account that, you know, you may have different variation either due, due to your printing system or to environment. So over time, your printing combination will actually need some readjustment. So leave room for this readjustment. Well, light and dark ink transition, this is something that some system, you know, having lightings will do. But a very interesting thing about this is that usually if you determine this for one printing combination, you can apply it for any other printing combination. There is no much variation because here is the, the it's a quantile relation between the light and dark inks. And once you establish it, you can reuse it without a remeasurement. So, getting back to uh, the way I'm setting up the ink limits per channel, for example, for cyan, cyan is a blue color. So, when we unfold the ink limits at different percentages, we can see the, the color values. And you can see that on the B axis, the variation is very small. We can put, you know, more ink, more ink, but the B value, it's hardly moving into one or the other of the directions. So eventually, I find the right amount of ink that is needed to give me the right amount of B value I would expect for the cyan ink. And the same procedure can go for magenta. But here, magenta is a red color, so I'm only looking at A axis. For yellow, it's simple, looking for B-axis. And you can see the more ink you put, the more, the less will be the impact of the axis of relevance 
over the color of that ink. So looking at the axis of relevance is a very good indicator when you reach your ink limit. For black, we need a very good optical density. So usually this is well, very well correlated with the L axis. So when we look at black, if we want at least 2.5 visual density or optical density, we need at least an L star of six. But we would prefer an L star of three because this is ideal minimum you know, L star value to give a good dynamic range for our backlit applications. Totaling limit. Well, there is no, th this is a parameter that most of your workflow will, will allow you to set. Some workflow, like EFI, allows you to actually measure a chart and gives you some indication about what will be the value. But most of the workflows will just print a chart and you will have to visually select what is your totaling limit. Well, this it's a combination of experience. So the more you work with your printing system and pr printing combination associated with it, the more you will realize you know, how soon you have to cut your ink. But it will also have some you know, physical indication. You will see bleeding effects or not drying or not curing effects on your total ink chart. One relevant thing here, it's the black point because usually in a modern system, relying your separation mostly on the K channel, that means that your black point will be mostly composed of black ink. And as a result, the L star of the black will be a very good indication of the L star of the black point. This is the economical factor I was telling you about. So you have to understand how your printing system works. So you have your vertical and horizontal resolution, and you have your drop size. And multiplying that with your printing area, and you get the relation between the milliliters of ink you're putting and the square meters you're printing. So for bellet application, putting more ink, that will result, of course, a more expensive product. But remember our best aim? We have to use the least amount of ink to give us our aims. Now, basically, we set up the total ink limits, we set up the ink limits per channel, we build up the gradation. Now it's time to transform our printing condition in a fully characterized printing condition. And for that, we are going to print uh, the profiling chart, which is usually either a 987.4 chart or the new universal LFP chart. This chart was developed uh, inside the Digital Printing Working Group Technical Committee that is hosted by FOGRA. And one of its most important characteristics is that it allows different machining devices to read it. So you can use your i1 Pro, your IO, you can use your Konica Minota devices like D7, or your Barbieri devices like Spectral FP. All of them can measure this chart. And this is a very good chart also for backlit application profiling because it gives you big size uh, patches and the uniformity and uh, smoothness of data you need for capturing your characterization data set. Well, this is our last stage of creating the media set. So we printed the chart, we measured it, we got our characterization data, now we are going to generate our ICC profile. Some profiling applications allow, for example, the setting of some other um, viewing environments than the D50. This is the default uh, you know, color temperature for the ICC profile. But some software, like i1 Profiler, which is a fully spectral software, allow you the readout of your actual light box light and use it in the profile generation. One issue we are having here is the UV component. There is not so much study done on how the UV you know, behaves when it comes to backlit application. For example, from paper, we have very nice knowledge base in respect of optical brightness additions and uh, how they need to be measured using the M1 condition. But we don't have any measurement device that can measure M1 for uh, transparent measurement, but we also 
have the very big component not only in substrate itself but in the light of the viewing booth. And this is something that is not yet scientifically you know, looked into and we have no idea actually how this will correlate with what we see. So the relation between the measure actual measurement, actual usage of the viewing uh, uh, light and how this correlates with the visual assessment from the observer. But you can still experiment with this. If you want to do it, for example, with I1 profile, it's not that complicated. So just use your uh, light head with I1, put it in contact with the uh, light box, and on top of the light box have an unprinted uh, substrate, like you would normally do when you put your backlit film, for example. Leave it like 30 minutes to get on the right temperature, and then do some measurements. Of course, you will need some averaging because uh, you know these uh, illuminators won't have a uniform uh, surface so you have to do several measurements average them and you get a spectral description of your uh, viewing illuminator some consideration about profile generation for example the settings in x right i1 profiler I usually prefer the max K method because this will give us specific advantages. I'm going to talk about them in the next slide. I'm also recommend to use the large settings, also the 16-bit fun uh, functions, and the CCAT02. This is the best chromatic adaptation algorithm we are having right now, and the ICC version version 4. Getting back to the mass K full separation, there are some pros and cons, but mostly this is a very nice separation procedure. Your separation will mostly rely on the black channel, will use the least amount of ink, and because the black is the least in constant color, that means your gray ramp will be very visual pleasing, regardless of the viewing conditions. So you can perceive gray as gray, with such a separation, either if you are under standard D50 or you are under, I don't know, office uh, illuminant. Now, to validate our result, well, we can evaluate so-called device mode, you know, how your printing condition behave, just, you know, report it to the aim values. And you can do this evaluation, you know, periodically to see if your printing equipment drifted or you can evaluate also from the point of view of the color accuracy, you know, in simulation mode, how accurately your printing combination simulates your intending reference printing condition. And these two aspects summed up are giving us the total quality. And this is a very, you know, complete way of actually controlling your printing, uh, output printing condition and to verify it periodically in order to establish if it's still okay, or it needs readjustment or calibration. Now, quality assurance is a little bit different from this validation procedure because this is something that you are going to do either by process check or by print check. So this relates to daily production activities and to newly substrates that are entering into production. So you apply all the procedures and the know-how you are gained in relation to this kind of substrates to your whole process and you can create media sets as, it's, as they are required. From the point of view of, of, uh, of print check, so your production, make sure you put a well-identified you know, job ticket so you know what you did here, you know what was the job, what was the printing condition, what uh, was the simulation all of this information is very useful. Don't forget to put your media wedge. The best one will be to use the uh, LFP version of it. And in order to have, you know, a, a safety measure, you know, just store one copy of your production somewhere safe. So if your customer is getting back to you with quality complaints, you can take your copy, you know, and see what have been done and see what are the customer concerns and address them in an objectively way. I already said this thing several times, linearization, recalibration. This is a very nice feature that most of the workflow, modern workflow have it, and it's very useful because once you created a very good and stable media set, this 
prelinearization procedure will allow you to compensate for your printing equipment and printing combination drifting over time. So if you are having you know, quality concerns, then you can simply use this relinearization function to actually measure your four color gradation and readjust this gradation in order to match the original aim value of the media set. This is an example you know, that uh, I took from, uh, from my laboratory where I have like, a printing combination on a backlit film that was done like a year ago. I never printed on, on it since and I measure it again one year later. The print heads were changed like two, three times because they were worn out. I printed the chart, measured it and my printing combination got back into its uh, reference values. So it's very easy, it saves you a lot of time. I already said that uh, the way we are going to measure this uh, 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 substrate is in a relative way. So uh, this is also the way that we are going to evaluate the Beglit application, the so-called media relative. So in this media relative mode, we only evaluate the average and also the maximum uh, 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 delta is of uh, the media wedge. So we are having, as specified by the process standard digital procedure, we are having three quality levels and we can see how this uh, reproduction fits in. Well, the handling of spot color is more or less similar. So we just need a very, you know, specific information. I mean, what is a spot color? Is the spot color from our color library? Is the spot color from another library? Which is the current reference? Because, you know, when you look, for example, at Panton, you have Panton and Pan Panton Plus, and the same code may actually refer to a different color. So make sure that you are reproducing the right spot color. Visual comparison and appraisal. You know, we are having, because our viewing system is basically dependent on the viewing environment, when we look at the same reproduction under, you know, different viewing conditions, we can see very easily that our colors change, so our perception of color actually change. So we are having two effects, one is called metamerism and the other one is called inconstancy and we have to make sure that none of them is creating a problem for our reproduction. This is another specific situation for the Beglit application. What's happening with the Beglit application that it's also viewed with the light on on and with the light off, light off. You know, usually this type of printing it's done either both sides, so dual printing side, or is done with just one side, but you're having like one ink of layer, then you're having white, and then you're having another ink of layer. And this type of application, they are conceptual made to be viewed both with light on and with light off. So when you look at them, if you're making a reflective measurement, you know, your reproduction will look very nicely in reflective mode, but as soon as you turn the light on, you will see a very, you know, uh, faded away reproduction. The other way around, you do it in backlit mode, light on, reproduction looks very nice, but as soon as you turn off your light, your reproduction is becoming very dark and you don't see the details and the color are not that saturated. So how we are going to handle this situation? This situation is usually common for double side printing or for the one side printing with the three layers of ink. So what we are going to do? Well, we are going to actually assess both responses. So we are starting to do the media set as we done in the previous stage, but this time we are going to do measurement in both reflective and transmissive way for the same sample. So we print our linearization chart, for example, we measure it, and then we look at both responses. And our aim is actually to find the, you know, ink amount that will give us the same H. So the hue response will be identical in both reflective and transmissive. So when we look, for example, at this Beglit reproduction, we are hit seeing here both ramps, cyan, in both reflective and transmissive mode. And then we, we can see that we can find an H value where we have the same amount of ink that in reflective and transmissive mode, it's identical. We are going to do the same for
for magenta. Sorry, the flicker is not working anymore. Okay. So for magenta, we can see the same effect. We can find the quantity of ink that has a similar H response in both reflective and transmissive. And this goes for yellow. Well, they no, may not be identical because the substrate itself will alter the ink response, but we need, just need to find you know, the closest H response between the same ink on reflective and transmissive. And for black, here we just need to obtain you know, a good enough L star value for reflective and L star value for transmissive. And this way we basically establish just one setup that is done in reflective mode that will be correctly reproduced also in transmissive mode. Because the effect is just to scale up based on the H value of the colorants between reflection and transmission. So this is the way you can handle the reproduction of dual viewing environment uh, backlit applications, so light on and light off. So the question is, what if we are only printing one side? I mean, it's obvious that we cannot obtain the same level of performance what we did with either two sides printing or with three ink layers printing. But there are some applications that requires that, you know, just with one ink layer, you will have, you know, the better production in both light on and light off. So what we are going for this situation? Actually, we have a compromise solution. We do the measurement in backlit mode. We do the measurement in reflective mode. We average them and we use the resulting characterization data for a universal set that will address both reflective printing and transmission printing. So this is a compromise. It's not perfect, but if you really need to print just one ink layer, you can do it in this way, and it will solve your backlit on, backlit, sorry, light on, light off situation. Just a uh, refresh. Uh, I'm also the editor of the uh, ISO TS-15311 Part 3. This is the uh, large format digital printing for the signage applications. And this is something that I work for the past couple of years, trying to find the common ground and agreement between different you know, players in the market and different uh, uh, um, area of the graphic industry that have interest in, into this uh, uh, standardization. And the initial proposal was trying only to address the so-called paper-like substrates. But we all know that in large format printing, we actually have a big variety of substrates that are not paper-like. So right now, what I managed to do is to get the acceptance that we can include also the backlit application substrate, for example, and any other substrate that is non-paper-like and that can pass the so-called visual plausibility test. This is a very simple test. We actually transform our output printing condition and use it to proof, to make a proof. So we make a proof of our printing combination. We print it on our proofing paper, we're printing on an actual substrate, and then we put them side by side. If we have a visual match, that means that the numerical measurement is falling in line with the visual assessment. And this is the simple visual plausibility test that will allow us to apply all the image quality and color accuracy metrics that will be covered by 15.3.11 part three on any non-paper-like substrate. Another thing is that the whole standard is based on 364 viewing conditions, so that apply for both reflective and transmission uh, viewing conditions. And we have two governing aspects. One is the application aspect, which is very difficult to you know, quantify because we have applications that overlap as a, a applicability, uh, they have, may have different uh, level of quality, and this is a very difficult way to classify signage application. So the second governing aspect is actually the visual, uh, the, the viewing distance. And the standard, it's introducing four viewing distance, so the close range viewing distance, that it's up to 1.5 meters. The one to five to five meter, this is so-called POS, POP range. And then five meter to 50 meter, this is the uh, poster uh, or banner range, and then we are having the billboard range that are products, you know, big sizes like meshes or uh, front leads that are like 30, 40 meters away, and this is the highest viewing range. And for each of these viewing distances, we will have color 
uh, sorry, image quality metrics that will give us the tools to assess the quality of the printed product. The color accuracy levels will be independent of the viewing distance. So you may have, let's say, a wide range viewing distance application that will have the same color accuracy like a close range one. So the color accuracy is completely detached of uh, the viewing distance. And with this, my presentation is over. I hope you found some useful information in it. And if you like to ask questions, feel free to do it. Thank you very much.